Uh, I found out, uh, this is uh, probably a week ago, I found out that my, um, my tablet will actually read my sermon. So maybe someday if I have laryngitis, I can just stand up here and lip sync it or something. But I thought I would start out today because I've got a couple of jokes to start out with. And, you know, jokes have kind of uh, surprise endings. That's what makes them funny. You didn't see it coming. So I thought I would let Computron here start us out. Well, I haven't, I have not tested this. So I do not know how this is going to work. Is this on? This is on. Okay, that's good. So here we go. First one, of course, we're going to start out with a classic, a knock-knock joke. And we'll see how this goes here. Knock, knock, who's there? Hike, hike who? I didn't know you liked Japanese poetry. Yeah, there's more, yeah. <laughs> Never trust math teachers who use graph paper. They're always plotting something. Question. Okay, so that was a little better, huh? Number three. Why is Cinderella so bad at soccer? Answer, because she always runs away from the ball. Last but not least. My wife keeps telling me that I'm the cheapest person she has ever met in her life. I'm not buying it. <laughs> I'm not buying it. Uh, anyway, yeah, so there's a setup. There's an unexpected ending. And uh, those weren't great jokes. I'm sorry about that. Um, in the ministry of Jesus, he didn't tell a lot of jokes. I do think there was some humor in there, but he did tell a lot of stories. He told a lot of parables, and what they have in common with most jokes is there's a setup and there's a surprise. There's something uh, virtually always in the stories Jesus told. There is something, there's a wham moment. There, there's something surprising there. And the one that we're going to look at this morning comes from Matthew chapter 21, uh, we'll start in verse 28. Jesus said, what do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And his son answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said the same. And he answered, I will go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. Even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. Jesus talked about a very simple idea. Revival is not enough. Like, you need to encounter God. You need to experience God, but that's not enough. What are you going to do with that? What alterations, what changes in your life will you make because you have had a genuine encounter with God? What comes next? Staying in alignment with the Lord, that will determine how you do in your life. And we're going to unpack that story here in just a few moments. A theme in that parable, and in so many of his parables, has to do with what we assume to be true is actually fundamentally off. And Jesus was always, always asking people like us to check our assumptions. And often his parables were these kind of programmed collisions, high-impact stories where Jesus caused reality, kingdom reality, to collide with the perceptions of the people who were hearing him teach. Like, 
I remember a movie, it's, it's been, I think, 20 years back now called The Truman Show. It featured Jim Carrey. It was a good movie. I think Ed Harris was in that movie, too. But the plot was interesting. The plot was this guy. His name was Truman Burbank, played by Jim Carrey. His entire life had been televised from birth up until this moment. I think he's something like 30 years old. But he is completely unaware of the fact that he is the star of this reality show. He's on this little island covered in a, in a giant dome and every element of his life from birth on has been regulated. All of the people that he enters at, interacts with are actors. It's just a giant stage. He is the only one who is not aware that he is on this 24-hour television program. But the producer, Ed Harris, his name in the show is Kristoff, um, he is He's capturing Truman's real emotions and reactions to different things that they cause to happen in his world. And so his entire hometown, Sea Haven, a little island town, Sea Haven, basically this big studio set. And he doesn't know what's going on. But at one point, he begins to suspect something is up with his world. There are some things that don't always add up. He sees that uh, if he suddenly changes his routine, he notices some things kind of out of the corner of his eyes that are, that are being adjusted, that he's kind of surprising the people around him. And so during the 30th year of the show, he really questions the nature of his reality. But the producer and the crew and the actors, they just keep on going and they are determined to keep him from finding out what's up. At one point, he gets in, goes to the town harbor, he gets in a small sailboat, and he begins to sail out. Remember, this is all in this giant dome. He begins to sail out and, and to try to keep him from getting to the edge of the dome, which is just like a painted horizon. To keep him from getting there, the producer calls in a storm. And so waves are tossing him around, but he fights through and he gets to the edge. And guess what? The bow of his boat pierces the side of that dome. The fabric of his reality literally tears. And the dumbstruck Truman suddenly discovers that there is a stairway there nearby leading up to a door on the horizon, this door in the clouds that says, Exit! That's his moment of truth. He climbs those stairs, opens the door, and has, in the climax of the movie, an encounter with the producer. He asks the producer, Who are you? Christoph replies, I'm the creator of a television show that gives people hope and joy and inspires millions. Truman says, and who am I? The producer replies, you are the star. Truman says, so was nothing real? Christoph replies, you were real. That's what made you so good to watch. You know, in the Gospels, we discover Jesus is the producer of reality. He is literally the creator of this world. And he comes from heaven to earth. And he's not trying to veil reality. He's not trying to hide reality. He's not trying to create an illusion. He's trying to show us what is really up. Who we are. What we are destined for. What really matters here. People, I think you would agree with me, throughout the centuries, people have suspected something was up. They've noticed some things out of the corner of their eyes. 
different religions, different philosophies, different ideologies, cultures. Um, throughout the centuries, regular folks have, have thought this, this world isn't all there is. And so this is on your outline this morning. One of the things Jesus does throughout his ministry, Jesus invites people into the bigger reality. The one they long suspected was out there. Now when Jesus showed up and started pulling back the curtain, it, it was not, let's be clear, it was not to say, this world is fake. Right? This world is a, is a movie set. This world doesn't matter. He wasn't minimizing injustice and pain and suffering and things like that. Never minimized the, the struggles that we face. What he did, though, was reveal that there is much more going on than we perceive. The kingdom of God, it's real, it's permanent. It is the greater reality, and Jesus, the king of reality, was, was always inviting people into that. Sadly, many over the centuries have politely declined his invitation. They've denied the reality that he was showing them. Think about it, though. His parables, these, these little stories Jesus told, they were hardly soothing bedtime stories. They weren't just jokes or sermon illustrations to keep an audience's attention. They were more than that. They, the, the parables of Jesus, they were subversive. I think of them like literary IEDs, little explosive devices. On the surface, nothing to see here. On the, on the surface, innocuous. After all, they spoke of, of common, everyday things, agricultural images or investments or, or fathers and sons, stuff like that. But when you step into one of these stories you suddenly find your assumptions upended. In his teachings, Jesus says, the first are last. Jesus says, the 99 are left behind so that the one can be found. Jesus says, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Surprise after surprise, wham, wham, wham. Back to that story we started out with in Matthew chapter 21. We've got a successful business owner and head of household. He has this vineyard that he operates. He also has two different, two sons, an older son, a younger son, and he asks each of them a question which is quite straightforward, one that they've probably been asked a lot of times before. He says, hey son, I need for you to go out today and work in the vineyard, all right? The first son said the wrong thing and then did the right thing. The second son said the right thing and then did the wrong thing. You remember? The second son, yeah, dad, absolutely. I'll go into the vineyard and then he, you know, I don't know what he did. I'll play on the PlayStation or something. I mean, he, he did not go and do what was asked of him. He did not go and do what he had agreed to do. And the other was like, no, I don't think I'm going to do that, dad. Uh-uh. And then he changed his mind, got on his work clothes, went out into the vineyard. And then Jesus asks one of the easiest questions he ever asked. What a softball question. He said, which of the two sons did what the father asked? Easy. The first son. They didn't hesitate to answer, and they were right. The first son, he may not have initially responded with the right answer. 
the right words, but he did exactly what his father asked of him. He went out into the vineyard and he got to work. Now, this is always a good thing to ask when we read the parables. When Jesus was telling this story, who was he telling this story to? The answer is in Matthew chapter 21, verse 23. We are told that Jesus was in the temple courts and that Jesus was amongst the teachers of the law, the chief priests, the elders of the people. So, he planted this IED in a place where he knew the country's most religious people would step right on top of it. The people who heard this story were the people who showed up at the temple every time the doors opened. They were the people who knew all of the lyrics to the praise songs that were sung there at the temple. They were the people who knew the right words to pray when they were invited to lead a prayer there at the temple. They had all the words, right? They read God's words. They prayed Words to God, carefully worded prayers. They praised God with the words that came out of their mouths. With their, with their mouths, they said, yes, Lord, yes. Yes, God. But their lives didn't say yes to God. Their lives were out of alignment with God. Their lives were not yielded to the work He called them to do. And then, interesting in that little story we read, right? He wraps up by talking about the crooks, the tax collectors, the crooks and the prostitutes. I mean, they had no clue how to pray. They didn't darken the door of the temple. They didn't know the songs that they sang up there at the temple. They didn't know the words written in the Word of God in the Bible. But here's the thing. When they, and watch this in the ministry of Jesus, when this group heard the gospel, it sounded like good news to them. When they heard Jesus give them this kingdom invitation, they were responsive. They said yes, and they jumped right in. Now this was easy to miss. Like, if you are just making quick judgments based on how things look and sound... Well, the religious people are the saved group, and the outsiders are the lost group. But welcome to reality, you know? Walking the walk is what matters, not talking the talk. Your words don't matter if your walk doesn't back them up. One can know the Father's will, but that means zero if that person's life doesn't show the Father's will. Like if God's will is not showing up in their home, in their marriage, in the way they treat their neighbors, in the way they give, in the way they serve, the words don't mean anything. Like if, if you don't obey the bit that the Father has asked of you, you can't compensate for that by learning about all of the other things the Father has asked in Scripture. Write this down on your outline. A surplus of information does not offset a deficit of transformation. Right? Knowing the Bible cover to cover does not cover up a life of disobedience or partial obedience to God. 
And so we've been talking about revival since the first of the year. And hopefully we've learned a lot from, from the Word about what it means to have an encounter with God on His terms, to experience this dynamic relationship with the producer of reality. But for revival to happen, learning about it isn't enough. Reading about it isn't enough. Knowing about revival and experience revival are two very different things. And so my prayer for myself, for this church, for all of us, is that we will not only say yes to Jesus but that we will actually follow Him in a master-servant relationship, that He will truly be our Lord. Jesus puts it this way in John chapter 14, verse 15. Jesus said, If you love me, you will obey what I command. So do I love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Your lifestyle is going to answer that question much more convincingly than your words ever will. Stepping into his kingdom reality involves lining up my attitudes and my actions with his will for my life. In this message that Jesus told, this little story about this father and these two sons, we also, and you may miss this at first, I missed this at first, there is also a message about grace. There is a message in this story that Jesus told about second chances. The one who gets it right in the end is the one who totally blew it. In the beginning, the child who looked at his father in the eye and said, No, I refuse to do what you have asked of me. That's the child who ends up reconsidering. Who ends up participating in the father's vineyard work after all. That's grace. I mean, right? I mean, the father doesn't react to his son's no with a slap across the face. The father doesn't react to his son's no with, you are no longer my son. The father in the story gives his boy a little time. He has some patience so that this child of his in the end can give a different answer. I'm a big fan, by the way, of second chances. Uh, More importantly, for us, so is the Lord. So write this down on your outline this morning. God is a God of second chances. This story is an invitation to say yes to Jesus, even if you have said no to Jesus before. The story is an invitation. Welcome to reality. Welcome to the kingdom of God. Saying yes to God. Stepping into His vineyard. Stepping into His world. That is where you discover who you are. What you are here to do and discover the amazing mind-blowing future the Lord has prepared for you. The stories that we love and the parables that Jesus told often have surprise endings. But the greatest surprise of all in the end is that sinners like you and me are not only welcome into the kingdom, but that the the king of the universe, John 14, verse 2, Jesus Christ, he is actually preparing a place for us in heaven to live with him 
throughout eternity. This morning, if you need to respond to that invitation, if you need to say yes to Jesus, it doesn't matter if you've said no to Jesus before. He loves to give second chances. By His grace, you're here today. By His grace, you can say yes. And by His grace, He will receive you into His kingdom, washing away your sins, powering your life with the gift of the Holy Spirit, surrounding you with sisters and brothers, a new family. We would love to welcome you into the family of God this morning. You can be baptized in the name of Jesus right here this morning. Maybe you just need prayers this morning. And we would invite you to find someone to circle up with and and pray with whatever it is that's on your heart, on your mind. Pray over somebody or ask them to pray with you. We want to be responsive to the Father. We want to be responsive to the Spirit. We want to be responsive to the Son. Let's stand together and respond.